Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, the latest instalment in a scathing report into the presidency of former South African leader Jacob Zuma says that he played a critical role in the plunder of state entities. About 880 million euros worth of contracts for the ESCOM power utility are thought to have been shadily awarded. Also, at the end of last year, Sub-Saharan Africa was looking like it was coming out of the pandemic economically stronger than first feared. But all that's changed since the war in Ukraine caused a surge in oil and food prices. We speak to the IMF's Africa chief about what adjustments are needed for the region's recovery. And Niger approves a groundbreaking British malaria vaccine for under fives. The World Health Organization's called for more kids to be inoculated in sub-Saharan Africa. It's where 95% of all the world's cases occur. Burkina Faso is one of the worst affected countries and researchers there are looking at locally produced vaccines. But first, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has received a damning fourth instalment of a report into allegations of corruption under his predecessor, Jacob Zuma. Investigators say that Zuma had a critical role in the mismanagement of state businesses and that he would do anything to advance the business interests of the notorious Gupta brothers. Zuma allegedly awarded around 880 million euros worth of contracts for public power utility ESCOM to firms linked to the Guptas. The report also says government accomplices, accomplices benefited from capturing the national treasury and a billion rand housing project. Our Nadine Theron brings us more from Cape Town. The capture of South Africa's state power supplier, ESCOM, is one of the most damning revelations in the recent report by Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. Currently, ESCOM is in debt of almost 400 billion rand and it's struggling to keep the lights on. Only last week, South Africa's economy had to cope with three planned daily power outages. Now the report reveals that state capture cost ESCOM more than 14 billion rand. Former President Jacob Zuma is identified as one of the key players in the Gupta family's plan to capture ESCOM. The report alleges that in 2015, ESCOM financially enabled the Gupta family to purchase Optimum Coal Mine from Glencore by giving it guarantees of millions. The report recommends that ESCOM executives involved should be criminally charged for this. Some top government officials are also implicated in the report, like the former Minister of Environmental Affairs the former Minister of Health and the current Deputy Minister of State Security, Zizi Kodwa. They allegedly personally benefited millions from a program intended to protect poor people from asbestos poisoning. President Cyril Ramaphosa said that he will only act on the Commission's re recommendations once he's received the final report on the 15th of June. Well, Libya is losing tens of millions of dollars a day since the force shut down of several of its oil fields and terminals forced loyal by, by forces loyal to a parliament based in Tobruk in the east. That's a direct rival to another government based in Tripoli. After a decade of conflict, this latest crisis was triggered after over seven billion euros worth of oil revenue was transferred to the Tripoli administration. The blockade has rocked the economy. Kimi Nedlek tells us more. A political power struggle now playing out on Libya's oil fields. Armed groups close to General Khalifa Haftar have forced the closure of two major oil terminals and a number of other sites in the east of the country. The National Petroleum Company declared a state of force majeure, while the UN-backed Tripoli government denounced the move as blackmail. We absolutely do not agree with this mechanism to demand rights. Of course, we agree with demanding rights and with the equal distribution of development across Libya. We will not accept extortion or using a public good that impacts all citizens. As well as a bigger share of oil revenue, the armed forces also demand that power be transferred to the rival government in Tobruk. This is not the first time that eastern forces have imposed an oil blockade. In early 2020, during the civil war, a blockade imposed by General Haftar lasted several months. The government estimates that this latest shutdown is costing state coffers more than 50 million euros per day. 
In terms of damage to the Libyan state due to closures, of course there will be revenue shortages. There's also a hefty opportunity cost, as while other oil producers around the world will be profiting from soaring oil prices due to the war in Ukraine, Tripoli will miss out. Now, the war in Ukraine has dealt a devastating blow to sub-Saharan Africa's economic recovery. In its latest report, the International Monetary Fund says that though the end of 2021 saw the region coming out of the pandemic better than feared, with growth, growth being revised upwards from 3.7% to 4.5%, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has hit that hard. Surging oil and food prices have compounded the damage done by COVID-19, climate change and insecurity, but recovery is expected to send out shoots in 2023. So to talk all this through, I'm joined by Abebe Amro Selassie, the director of the IMF's Africa division. Abebe, thanks so much for joining us. Now, first of all, give me a bit of a sense of the magnitude of the shock that the war in Ukraine's delivered to sub-Saharan Africa's economic outlook. Thank you um, for having me. So as you were flagging, um, indeed, you know, we had uh, towards the end of the year growth finally beginning to gain momentum in the region uh, in terms of the recovery from the effects of the pandemic. But with Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, and uh, the attendance increase, sharp increase, I should say, in food and fuel prices, uh, we fear that uh, growth outlook this year is going to be uh, quite negative. I mean, that growth will decelerate from four and a half percent last year to around 3.8 percent. But this really also masks quite a lot of dislocation that's going to be caused uh, to poor and uh, vulnerable households in particular. This is because both food and fuel prices have shot up. Uh, as you can imagine, in a region like Sub-Saharan Africa, where uh, food consumption accounts for a big share of incomes, um, higher food prices will mean that, you know, uh, there's going to be a lot of people that are not going to have as much food on the table as, as uh, when prices were lower. And fuel prices, of course, also have the effect of uh, cascading uh, cascading and raising costs through the economy. So inflation uh, will accelerate, again, impacting the cost of living and eroding uh, living standards. So uh, a, a worrying moment for the region. But are there some countries who may be riding this out better than others? I mean, we're talking about a vast region, a vast variance in kinds of economies. Um, are, are, are any of them doing better than, than this kind of scenario you've, you've set out? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, you know, uh, oil exporting countries in particular will definitely benefit from higher commodity prices. Also other commodity export, exporters, because we've seen the price of metals um, and other, other hard commodities also going up. So these countries will benefit. But I want to underscore here that, you know, even in this case, I mean, take a country like Nigeria or Angola, um, they export oil, so higher oil prices will benefit the you know, uh, fiscal accounts, uh, government revenues will be higher, uh, they'll be getting more export receipts. But even in these countries, because they don't have strong social safety nets, what is likely to happen is that you know, uh, governments are unlikely to be able to transfer resources quickly enough to vulnerable households. So even in these countries, higher food prices in particular, but fuel prices also will have a bearing. Uh, give, me, give me a quick sense of just some of the other issues hampering the, the continent's growth and stability. So, you know, uh, of course, uh, the developmental challenges the region face are multifaceted. Yeah? So in some countries, uh, climatic uh, shocks are having quite a significant effect. If you look at the Sahel, a number of countries have been impacted by drought. There's also countries in south uh, eastern part of uh, the continent, countries like Malawi, Mozambique, uh, uh, that have been impacted, Madagascar, that have been impacted quite severely by uh, cyclones, flooding, um, and or, you know, very rapidly changing climate weather. So you have those kind of slower moving, but really important drag, you know, factors that have been a drag on growth. Layered on top of this, of course, are also the conflicts uh, that have been a cause of concern. Uh, but really key uh, at the moment, and by far the, the shock that's concerning most policymakers in the region and impacting by far the largest number of people, is the surge in food and fuel prices. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of policies or reform do you think it will take to get the continent back moving in the right direction? So, you know, uh, something on the short term and something perhaps on the more uh, medium term. In the short term, really, the big challenge uh, policymakers are facing is how to mitigate uh, th these adverse effects 
on um, their people. Eh? So central banks, uh, ministries of finance are having really very difficult time to have to make trade-offs between how best to uh, provide support in the near term. And here, you know, we think that, you know, uh, food security, ensuring food security, of course, is paramount concern. And really, governments need to focus on doing whatever they can to mitigate, um, you know, the, the increase in food prices causing people not to have enough food to eat. So that, I think, is particularly important important right now. Now, over the medium to long term, I think, you know, putting in place reforms uh, that will ensure a robust, uh, robust response, improve countries' resilience will be important. What do I mean by a robust response? I mean, you know, uh, Africa, of course, is a region with lots of arable land, lots of uh, labor. So having, uh, you know, a dynamic agricultural sector, which can, you know, uh, provide uh, enough food for the region and even uh, export to the rest of the world will be important. So working on a strong supply response will be important. Abi, uh, thank you so much for speaking to me. Abi Amro Selassie there, the IMF's uh, director of the Africa Division, giving us a bit of a sense of some of the economic challenges faced by the continent as it tries to recover from the shocks caused by the war in Ukraine, climate change and instability in part of the region. Well, Friday was a public holiday in Kenya as leaders from across the continent and citizens turned out to pay their respects to late President Mwai Kibaki at his state funeral. Kibaki died aged 90 last week and in a tribute to him, President Uhuru Kenyatta called him one of the greatest African statesmen of his generation. The presidents of South Africa and South Sudan were amongst those who headed to Nairobi for a ceremony that saw hundreds of people line the streets as a military procession escorted the hearse carrying Kibaki's body to the national stadium. He'll be buried on Saturday at his ancestral home in central Kenya. And Niger has approved a malaria vaccination for under fives with a groundbreaking British vaccine. The campaign is due to start over the coming months and is one of many across the continent as it ramps up efforts to battle the spread of one of the world's deadliest killers. Sub-Saharan Africa is where 95 percent of all malaria cases and 96 percent of all deaths occur. In Burkina Faso, more than half the population is affected by the, by the disease every year. Our Khaled Yusai reports. At first glance, this might look like a simple health centre. Yet behind these walls, hundreds of researchers are working tirelessly in the hope of finding the vaccine to fight one of Africa's most deadliest diseases, malaria. Located about 100 kilometres from Ouagadougou, the Nanora Health Sciences Research Institute was created in 2008 by Professor Alidou Tinto. Today, he's proud to show us the future potential vaccine he's working on. This is where we keep our vaccines, in these refrigerators, because the temperature needs to be regulated. It has to be between 2 and 8 degrees, no more, no less. We also use solar energy to connect our refrigerators and freezers that store our vaccines, because the energy has to be stable. Clinical trials by Professor Tinto's scientific team, working with researchers at Oxford University, have shown that their vaccine is 77 percent effective. These results were achieved using state-of-the-art medical equipment. This machine allows you to know if you have malaria or not while you're doing your blood tests. And it's here in Nanoro that the device was greenlit for further distribution throughout the world. The research could take several more years. So until a vaccine is commercialized, Dr. Tinto believes that the best treatment is prevention. Sleeping under insecticide-treated mosquito nets has proven to work well. They are a very effective means of prevention. We tell people that until now we don't have a vaccine against malaria. We are in the phase of clinical trials. So we should apply these prevention methods. With 11 million malaria patients per year and nearly 10,000 deaths, Burkina Faso is among the 10 most affected countries in the world. But thanks to research, the number of deaths dropped by around 17 percent between 2016 and 2019. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us. Take care.